Hello and welcome to this online event uh, from the British Library. It's not entirely online because I'm sitting on the stage in the British Library Theatre and so is Hugh Bonneville. So we are in one space and then the other speakers are online and you are all online. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by a fantastic group of people to celebrate the story of Paddington, one of the best loved characters in children's literature, an iconic figure who needs very little introduction, but he provides a lot of food for thought about what is so great about children's literature. Later on, we'll be taking some of your questions. So if you want to send them in, please use the form just below the video screen and post your questions at any time. And we'd like to get in as many as possible, so just keep them coming. At the top of the screen, you'll also find a tab saying books, which you can click to find out not only the books, but also a lot of other Paddington goodies. And you'll find tabs there that allow you to send in your feedback about the event or to help support the work of the British Library. So you've got a job to do while we're talking. We're running the event tonight as part of a programme for an exhibition here at the British Library called Paddington, the story of a bear which you'll be hearing more about later in the event. It's been wonderful that so many people have been able to come to see the exhibition already, but if you'd like to come, and I do recommend it very, very strongly, it's on at the British Library until the 31st of October. And just today, I've been told that when uh, Chinese, it was the private view of the exhibition was put on, up on Chinese Weibo, 106,000 people viewed it. So this exhibition is travelling the world and it repays visiting in person if you can get here or in, online. The library has a number more exciting events coming up as part of the uh, exhibition. Among them, next Monday evening, we'll be hearing all about London's famous and magnificent railway stations from St Pancras, which the British Library is just next door to, to, of course, Paddington. It'll be a live talk by railway expert Christian Walmer. And at the end of, the October, of October, we have a proper feel-good celebration featuring the brilliant Calypso music band Tobago and Lime, who, if you remember the Paddington movies, appear on those. That's an event called London is the Place for Me after that famous song. Please have a look at the British Library for more details. And now I would like to introduce the speakers very briefly. The form is going to be, we're going to have a quick introduction. We're going to have a reading from Hugh Bonneville and then each of the speakers is going to talk. I'm going to have a small conversation with them, but then it will be very much over to you to ask your questions of them. So uh, I'm going to do this in strict alphabetical order. So we have R.W. Alley, who is known as Bob, so I hope he doesn't mind me, being call me calling him Bob, who's an award-winning uh, artist and illustrator both based in Rhode Island, USA, and he is joining us from there. The time difference works well. He's been illustrating Paddington since the 1990s, and he creates both black and white line illustrations for the books and colour illustrations. Alison Bailey is the British Library curator of Printed Heritage Collections from 1901 to 2000. She's a specialist on a great many things included in the British Library's collection, such as the British experience of the First World War of women's suffrage. And in particular, she is a specialist in British children's literature from all periods. She's the curator of the exhibition of Paddington, The Story of the Bear, and has previously curated other, collection, other exhibitions for children, including Animal Tales in 2015 and Twinkle Twinkle Little Bat, 400 Years of Poetry for Children. Hugh Bonneville is here today because he plays Mr Brown in the wonderful Paddington films, Paddington 1 and Paddington 2, but he is also well known as a stage actor. He worked for both the National Theatre and the Royal Shakespeare Company and as a film actor, appearing in many films, including Notting Hill but he's probably best known to us here for his many and varied TV roles, Downton Abbey and W1A to pick out just two. He is also a, long, a lifelong fan of Paddington and has a great deal to say about that too. Karen Jenkel is the daughter of Michael Bond and Brenda Bond. She was born just before A Bear Called, Bear Called Paddington was first published, so she's always grown up with the character from the book. She's been the managing director of Paddington and the CEO of, of, of she's been the managing director of Paddington & Co Limited for the past 30 years and has been closely involved with the development of Paddington, culminating with the film Paddington One. 
She's now retired from that role, but is still a trustee of Michael Bond's literary estate and is able to keep a careful watch on her father's legacy. But now, having set the scene, got the speakers, please can I ask Hugh to read and kick us off with the beginning of Paddington. This is uh, taken from the opening of the first book. Chapter one, please look after this bear. Mr. and Mrs. Brown first met Paddington on a railway platform. In fact, that was how he came to have such an unusual name for a bear, for Paddington was the name of the station. The Browns were there to meet their daughter, Judy, who was coming home from school for the holidays. It was a warm summer day, and the station was crowded with people on their way to the seaside. Trains were humming, loudspeakers blaring, porters rushing about, shouting at one another, and altogether there was so much noise that Mr. Brown, who saw him first, had to tell his wife several times before she understood. A bear? On Paddington Station? Mrs. Brown looked at her husband in amazement. Don't be silly, Henry, there can't be. Mr. Brown adjusted his glasses. But there is, he insisted. I distinctly saw it, over there, near the bicycle rack. It was wearing a funny kind of hat. Without waiting for a reply, he caught hold of his wife's arm and pushed her through the crowd, round a trolley laden with chocolate and cups of tea, past a bookstall, and through a gap in a pile of suitcases towards the lost property office. There you are, he announced triumphantly, pointing towards a dark corner. I told you so. Mrs. Brown followed the direction of his arm and dimly made out a small furry object in the shadows. It seemed to be sitting on some kind of suitcase and around its neck there was a label with some writing on it. The suitcase was old and battered and on the side in large letters were the words, wanted on voyage. Mrs. Brown clutched at her husband. Why, Henry, she exclaimed, I believe you were right after all. It is a bear. She peered at it more closely. It seemed a very unusual kind of bear. It was brown in colour, a rather dirty brown, and it was wearing a most odd-looking hat with a wide brim, just as Mr Brown had said. From beneath the brim, two large round eyes stared back at her. Some, seeing that something was expected of it, the bear stood up and politely raised its hat, revealing two black ears. Good afternoon it said in a small, clear voice. Uh, good, good afternoon, replied Mr. Brown, doubtfully. There was a moment of silence. The bear looked at them inquiringly. Can I help you? Mr. Brown looked rather embarrassed. Well, uh, no, uh, as, as a matter of fact, we were wondering if we could help you. Mrs. Brown bent down. You're a very small bear, she said. The bear puffed out its chest. I'm a very rare sort of bear, he replied importantly. There aren't many of us left where I come from. And where is that? asked Mrs Brown. The bear looked round carefully before replying, Darkest Peru. I'm not really supposed to be here at all. I'm a stowaway. A stowaway? Mr Brown lowered his voice and looked anxiously over his shoulder. He almost expected to see a policeman standing behind him with a notebook and pencil taking everything down. Yes, <laughs> said the bear. I emigrated, you know. A sad expression came into its eyes. I used to live with my Aunt Lucy in Peru, but she had to go into a home for retired bears. Well, you, you, you don't mean to say you've come all the way from South America by yourself, exclaimed Mrs Brown. The bear nodded. Aunt Lucy always said she wanted me to emigrate when I was old enough. That's why she taught me to speak English. Oh, but whatever did you do for food? asked Mr Brown. You must be starving. Bending down, the bear unlocked the suitcase with a small key, which it also had round its neck, and brought out an almost empty glass jar. I ate marmalade, he said rather proudly. Bears like marmalade, and I lived in a lifeboat. But what are you going to do now, said Mr Brown. You can't just sit on Paddington Station waiting for something to happen. Oh, I shall be all right, I expect. The bear bent down to do up its case again. As he did so, Mrs Brown caught a glimpse of the writing on the label. It, sim it said simply, please look after this bear. 
Thank you. She turned appealingly to her husband. Oh, Henry, what shall we do? We can't just leave him here. There's no knowing what might happen to him. London's such a big place when you've nowhere to go. Can't he come and stay with us for a few days? Mr Brown hesitated. But Mary, dear, we, we can't take him. Not just like that. After all... Well, after all what? Mrs Brown's voice had a firm note to it. She looked down at the bear. He is rather sweet. And he'd be such company for Jonathan and Judy, even if it's only for a little while. They'd never forgive, forg they'd never forgive, <laughs> they'd never forgive us if they knew you'd left him here. It all seems highly irregular, said Mr. Brown, doubtfully. I'm sure there's a law about it. He bent down. Would you like to come and stay with us? He asked. That is, he added hastily, not wishing to offend the bear, if you've nothing else planned. The bear jumped and his hat nearly fell off with excitement. Oh, yes, please. I should like that very much. I've nowhere to go, and everyone seems in such a hurry. Well, Dad's settled then, said Mrs Brown, before her husband could change his mind. And you can have marmalade for breakfast every morning. And she tried hard to think of something else that bears might like. Every morning? The bear looked as if it could hardly believe its ears. I only had it on special occasions at home. Marmalade's very expensive in darkest Peru. Then you shall have it every morning starting tomorrow, continued Mrs Brown, and honey on Sunday. A worried expression came over the bear's face. Will it cost very much, he asked. You see, I haven't very much money. Of course not. We wouldn't dream of charging you anything. We shall expect you to be one of the family, shan't we, Henry? Mrs Brown looked at her husband for support. Of course, said Mr Brown. By the way, he added, if you are coming home with us, you'd better know our names. This is Mrs Brown and I'm Mr Brown. The bear raised its hat politely, twice. I haven't really got a name, he said, only a Peruvian one, which no one can understand. Well, then we'd better give you an English one, said Mrs Brown. It'll make things much easier. She looked round the station for inspiration. It, it ought to be something special she said thoughtfully. As she spoke, an engine standing in one of the platforms gave a loud wail and a train began to move. I know what, she exclaimed. We found you on Paddington Station, so we'll call you Paddington. Paddington? The bear repeated it several times to make sure. It seems a very long name. Quite distinguished, said Mr Brown. Yes, I like Paddington as a name. Paddington, it shall be. <laughs> Thank you so much. And this is where we should all applaud, and I hope you all are uh, <laughs> wherever you are, because that was the most wonderful uh, introduction to a conversation. Um, so nice to hear a story being read aloud to us, and so much in that very brief extract that we know is at the heart of the Paddington stories. I'm now going to talk to Karen about, uh, can I be intrusive, Karen, and ask you about growing up with Paddington and how it felt to have this curious sibling um, who uh, you must have sometimes loved and sometimes loathed, like we all do with our siblings, really. Uh, how old were you when the books were published? Well, you may not answer. Oh, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> Just tell me about growing up with Paddington. Well, I can, actually. I, I was uh, two months old when the first book came out, so every time Paddington has a major anniversary, I'm reminded that um, I'm now in my 60s. Um, but, no, it was wonderful growing up with Paddington. I mean, of course, I never knew anything else. By the time I was aware, um, Paddington was very much part of the family. Um, and, uh, I mean, yes, you're right. Some, sometimes uh, younger siblings or, or siblings can get a bit annoying, but Paddington most <laughs> of the time was... was it's pretty wonderful to have around. It was very sticky because obviously there was a lot of marmalade everywhere. But <laughs> but did people endlessly kind of, you know, his catchphrase is that, that one of the extraordinary things about Paddington was how quickly, um, A, the image of him, but we'll get onto that talking about the illustration, but also things like the marmalade sandwiches um, and the curiosity of his name and being found on the station, abandoned and all of that. They were so publicly talked about. Did people ask you about those things? 
they did. Uh, probably, I mean, I suppose there was a time, perhaps when I was in my teens, um, when I was a little bit embarrassed by the whole thing, because mm. that, you know, that's all anybody ever wanted to talk about. But, but um, no, I mean, it, we, he, he was every, it was, it was very special. And I was enormously proud of my father all, all along, really. I mean, how wonderful to be lucky enough to grow up in, in a, not only in a, a house full of books, but in a, full of books that your own father's written. And, and so I, I think always felt very, very fortunate. Well, that's lovely to hear, but, and it's what I would expect because the whole experience is, so, is such a warm one. Um, tell us about how the story started. You know, I mean, obviously you weren't there while your father was originally penning them, but just fill us in on the background. Yes, well, it, it, my father had always wanted to be a writer. Um, at, at the time, he was working as a television cameraman for BBC, and my parents were living fairly near to, well, in, in Notting Hill at the time. And Christmas Eve 1956, my father was waiting for a bus outside Selfridges, and it started to snow, and he wandered in to the store. And for some reason, they, they didn't have any children at, at that point, but he found himself in the toy department, and there sitting all alone on a shelf, he found a solitary bear. And, and being the sort of man my father was, he felt that he couldn't possibly leave this poor bear sitting all alone over Christmas. So he bought him as a last minute stocking filler for my mother and took him home. And he gave him to my mother, they sat him on the mantelpiece. And a little while after Christmas, my father sat down one day at his typewriter and looking around the room for inspiration. And he saw this bear and he thought, you know, I've always thought that Paddington would make a good name for a character. And I, I wonder what would happen if a bear was found on Paddington Station. And he started to write, he didn't actually set out, he always says he didn't set out to write a children's book. He really wrote for his own pleasure. Mm -hmm. But in a, within about 10 days, he actually found that he'd written an entire children's book. And, and that's how it all began. Yes, I mean, that's very interesting because I think that's, quite, that's true of quite a lot of people who write children's books. They don't always know that's what it's going to be, but then they're very pleased when they've done it. Can I, um, did, you, did your mother like this bear when it was her surprise present in her stocking? Was she as pleased with it as he was for having found it? Absolutely delighted. And, and uh, I mean, he, this, the actual bear became a part of the family and, and still is. Mm. Um, my, my parents divorced uh, many years later, but very amicably. And so at that point, um, they, they took on joint custody of the bear. So he'd spend part of his time with my mother and part of his time with my father. <laughs> That's a very nice touch. Um, the, the, the obvious things we know about Paddington and we respond to very immediately are um, the humour and we love his politeness and we love the marmalade sandwiches and we love the duffel coat and we love all sorts of things like that. But what about the really big themes that are in Paddington, which are, I think, the thing that, I mean, I'm too old to have grown up on Paddington, but when it appeared in my childhood, um, I don't remember anybody talking about the themes of Paddington. It was just he was such a wonderful character and it was such a great, a great story, this idea of somebody... You know, that, that extraordinary thing that your father did of creating a character who we believe to be real, even though he's a bear, and we know he couldn't really be. Um, in fact, actually thinking about his birthday, I went to his 60th birthday party at the Peruvian Embassy in London, and on the way home, somebody rang, and I said, oh, I'm just on my way back from the most amazing party for Paddington's 60th birthday. So he said, do you, know, you do know he's not real? <laughs> I said, well, he's real to us. <laughs> but that, the big theme of, of the evacuation and and the um, tolerance and kindness and all of the things which now seem incredibly relevant. Do you remember that being discussed at the time that your father well, wrote it? I, I'm not sure it was specifically discussed, but it was a very much part of, of everybody's lives. Mm. Um, my father, uh, as I said at the beginning, was living in, in Notting Hill. So um, at, at the time, you know, there, there were a, a, a lot of immigrants living in the area. Um, he lived in, uh, he was a very kind, tolerant man himself. Um, and he, my father had a very strong belief in, in right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think he put that into his stories, into his books. So I think they just evolved from the, the kind of man that, that my father was and, and kind of by definition, um, you know, that that's how the, the books had the themes that they did, because they, they were things that my father was interested in that were important to him. Um, so but I don't think he ever really analysed um, his books. And I think very few writers actually analyse their books in that no. way. I think other people analyse yeah. them for them. Yeah. Um, but 
No, I, 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 you know, Paddington was very much, um, a lot of Paddington was very much my father himself, really, mm. and particularly the humour. Um, and uh, I, I mean, that, that my father was a very, very funny man. Mm. No, that doesn't surprise me. Um, well, that was what I was going to ask you next about him as a, as a father. Uh, you know, we know quite a lot about him as a writer. We know quite a lot about his life and how he was a cameraman. He had, there's a wonderful line in one of his uh, uh, biographies I read of him about him. It was a quote, actually, of his, so it's his autobiography, a broad biographical quote, saying that his mother liked the uniform of the school that he was sent to, and it was the only bad decision that she had ever made. So I thought that was a wonderfully quick way of dismissing your parental choice of education. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously school wasn't a great success for him, but then he found a job he loved being a cameraman, and then he gave that up to, to become a writer, so a very successful career. Um, but, but how did he do his writing, and when he was writing, what was your interaction with him? Did he listen to his children? Did he take advice? <laughs> He, he wrote all the time. Uh, and I think, again, successful writers, I mean, that that's really all they want to do. So he would get up very early in the morning uh, and he would write, write, he write, would write every day of the year, including Christmas Day. He never went anywhere without an envelope or a piece of paper in his wallet that he could pull out and jot down ideas and notes mm. as, as they as they came to him. So he worked very, very hard at it. Mm. Um, and I think he just took ideas from around him. He didn't certainly didn't ask for advice. Um, I never got to have the stories read to me until they were finished. Mm -hmm. uh, they would certainly be read before they were published, but only when he was really happy that that, that they were finished. Um, so I don't know if that really answers your question. Um, mm, but I, yeah. you know, he was he was he worked very hard at it. Well, he was writing about a book a year, wasn't he? I mean, there isn't one published actually sequentially every year, but if you look at the body of his work, I mean, he was very prolific. Y yes, and in fact, of course, he wasn't just writing Paddington. Um, no, because he's got the he old... Wrote, uh, you know, a lot of other things as yeah. well. So, um, but but yes, the Paddington in the early days, the, the novels initially were, were one a year, and then they sort of slowed up. And then I think he wrote one in, I think it was 1976, was the last one for a very long time. And then he wrote... Another one, um, really, I think it was probably for about the 50th anniversary, he suddenly got into the, the swing of writing the novels again. And then, of course, there were all the picture books in between, which right. is when, when Bob you yeah. know, started to illustrate in, in, in the 90s. Um, so there were many Paddington books in very lo lot of different forms. Hmm. And did he, do you think his writing changed after his... I mean, he became successful fairly quickly, um, you know, though it's very hard. I mean, you know, I, I'm sure, as you remember, it's his amazing uh, memorial service in St Paul's. I can't think of another children's writer who has had that honour. So, you know, he became so important in, in British children's literature. Um, but I wonder if his writing changed at all, do you think, in the years that he was doing it, as he became think, more successful? Yes. I think it, it, it didn't so much change as, as the themes changed. And what's amazing about Paddington is although he started writing in the 1950s and Paddington never really grows up himself but the world around him changes and so I think my father adapted his writing to adapt to the world around Paddington yeah. really um, I mean he he would have never done anything really um, ridiculous with Paddington like sending him to the moon but he certainly did get involved I mean in, in the more recent novels he uh, uses an oyster card on the buses and you know, mm. that that mm. sort of thing and mm. um, uh, and probably mobile phones would then sort of come into the stories or but and so, so yes he's, his writing as such didn't change but but the, the themes probably did. Mm. And what was he like as a father? You said he was very kind, but I wonder whether he was, you know, in our minds, we're confused as to whether he's Mr. Brown or Paddington. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a mixture of the two. <laughs> he, he was a lovely father. And I think what was uh, wonderful about him was he really took an interest in, in people and things, and he took an interest in one's life. And so, um, yes, yeah, so I think which is terribly important. And, and he always read to me, and he used to write most wonderful letters when I was away. And no, he was he was a very he was a, a fabulous father. Adored him. 
Oh, well, that's, that's, that's wonderful. You adored the sibling and you adored the father. It's actually <laughs> in a good place for my last question, which is really just to say congratulations on, to you and to him and to the family on having looked after Paddington, Paddington the entity, as it were, the publishing business, so well, and to have done something that's very hard to pull off in children's books, which is to have come up with a cracking good film. So I know you must have been watching over Paddington very carefully for the last... Uh, 30 years or however long you've been doing it. Um, what, what were the big challenges in that? Um, I think that people wanted to do a lot of things with Paddington that we had to sort of put our, our foot down about. Um, so it was making sure that we never, we never sort of compromised Paddington's integrity for, um, for, for making money. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, just to be absolutely blunt, that wasn't what it was about. It was making sure that Paddington uh, stayed true to himself. And it could have, it was very tempting. You know, we could have um, done so many things with him, but we always made sure that um, we only ever did what was right for Paddington. Mm, but that's, a, that's quite a big art. I mean, you make that sound quite easy, but I know it's very difficult. Because, as you say, the temptations to do all sorts of other things. And if you think of, you know, very beloved characters in children's literature, like um, Peter Rabbit, most particularly comes to mind, who have been has been much changed in how he looks by various iterations and currently on TV. And you've managed to keep Paddington looking like Paddington. Yeah. Yes. And, and of course, Paddington visually, and we'll probably come on to that in a minute with when you talk to Bob, um, actually do, does change in, in his appearance, except that he is always Paddington. He's always got that character, mm. um, his hat, his duffel coat, the things that go with him. And you always recognise him as Paddington. But I, I won't um, spoil what Bob's going to say. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very, very much for that. And that's just such a wonderful... I mean, it would be awful if you said you, you hadn't liked him, but <laughs> it was quite clear that you really, really did. Um, thank you. Um, Bob, can we move on to the images of Paddington? Because, uh, as I said at the beginning, you came into the Paddington story in the 1990s and um, Peggy Fortnum had already made her images of Paddington and Ivor Wood had done Paddington and David McKee had done Paddington. So there were quite a lot of images of Paddington, but um, as Karen said, they were kept, they were kept very... Um, tight we don't have kind of very different images of Paddington so there you were in 1990 you got a call and somebody said do you want to draw Paddington how did it how did it happen <laughs> well as as many things happen these days it was a corporate merger when a New York publisher and a London publisher merged and the New York office wanted to publish Paddington in the United States in a big way and I was working with them as uh, I was illustrating many books using a pen and ink and watercolor technique. And they felt that that would be certainly very appropriate for um, uh, Paddington books. And Michael had agreed to write some brand new picture books. And so there were manuscripts available. And I went over to London and auditioned with Michael and found him to be exactly as Karen has <laughs> spoken of him uh, to be a wonderful and open person and not, I mean, so generous as not to be put off at all that an American would, would deign to, 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 to even consider illustrating a, um, an iconic British character. But I was drawn to Paddington because my work is for kids is all about making friendly, kind, inclusive characters and I'm not, I'm not an artist who is um, burdened with any particular technical skill. I do what I do, and it's, it, it, I'm just trying to make something that makes me happy. When I'm having a bad day, my characters have a bad day, and the waste bin gets full of, <laughs> full of pieces of paper. So being offered the chance to, um, to illustrate a character who is at heart as optimistic and as... Um, as engaging and as friendly and as open to the world as Paddington was, uh, you, you don't say no to an opportunity like that. Mm. Um, I also had the amazing pleasure of not really knowing the scope of all the Paddington uh, novels. So I got to read them one after another all at once and it was absolutely marvelous. And um, and then then I saw Michael's picture book versions that he was um, he was uh, he just written and it it was just it was just going to be marvelous. So 
and luckily he liked he liked my characters that I that I presented him with. Um, I think all except for Mr. Gruber, who he wasn't really pleased with my first interpretation of, and I went back to my hotel room and redrew redrew him and showed it to Michael the next morning, and he did like it. And that, that's when I noticed that my Mr. Gruber looks a lot like Mr. Bond. <laughs> but that was obviously just just happenstance. Just I mean, you know, what do you do in a case? <laughs> But you must, when you started, when you took on this job, even though you were uh, illustrating it for the American market, so, you know, one of the interesting things about Paddington, we in the UK think of him as so, you know, quintessentially British, but yet he's published all over the world, and the image of him remained pretty constant. Um, so you, did you, what did you do about the previous illustrators, so to speak? Did you go back and look what they'd done and make your own version, or did you try and draw from the text direct? Mostly, well, I had to look, you know, having immersed myself in the novels, I became incredibly familiar with Peggy's drawings. And those seem to still um, engage the heart of, of Paddington. And so my drawing sort of sprung from her illustrations more than um, any other previous illustrators. But the thing, the thing that's remarkable as, um, as a, uh, as a visual artist about a character like Paddington is that he has been shown in so many different forms of um, a very, uh, a, a very harsh style of, um, of cartooning all the way to, you know, the, the wonderful uh, fluffiness of the films, but it's always Paddington because no matter the, the style, it's, all the illustrators have managed to get at the heart of the character. And I don't know whether it's in the eyes, I don't know whether it's in the motion, but I think, you know what, I think it's really in the words. Yeah. I think if you pay attention to the words, because when you're illustrating a character, you have, you have the words first and foremost in your head, and they're always running through your mind when you're drawing. And at some point you turn off your, um, the decision-making process of, uh, if something is good or bad and you just go with the feeling of um, mm. uh, that, that's coming out on the paper. So it's, um, it, it's kind of hard to, hard to explain it, but um, it's, it's, the character is just so universal and so appealing that he translates all over the world. And I was lucky too, because um, Michael's, when you saw my picture said that he would, um, let me illustrate all of the books throughout the world, and that was wow. that was very nice. As opposed to fragment, maybe he was yeah. tired of of all the fragmenting and wanted to have sort of a, un, a unified look. I don't know, but I felt really lucky on that one. Yeah, and now I think you're going to show us. Uh, you're going to give us ah. some drawings, some live drawing of how to do passion. Yes. If yes, you want to take, you're, you're going to now be um, six year olds, and uh, and this is what I do with uh, the six year olds. I show them how I draw a a, a character. And so, um, but the thing about this is that Paddington has so uh, is such an iconic character that you just need to draw a few a few lines, and he comes to he comes to life. For instance, um, let's see. I always start out by by making sure that I have, I have the image slightly sketched out like this. And let's see, in this case, he'll be, he'll be taking off from Hugh's wonderful reading and uh, greeting, greeting the Browns with his hat coming up and he'll have his coat on, even though, yeah, well, doesn't appear in the very first novel until a little later, but that's okay. So, and Paddington, uh, I always start with, with his nose and his eyes like this and the black ears coming up like this and a little bit of fur coming around and his coat sits on his, on his body like this and his arm will come up. And the main thing is not to get too particular. I don't know if, if your students of writing you will notice that Michael's texts are specific, but not specific at the same time. And that's the wonderful part about them because they don't, things get pinned down too quickly sometimes in literature. 
Now this is um, this is some watercolor coming on here, but we're but I'm using a crayon. And Paddington's hat. Had, we had a big discussion, uh, Mike and I did about uh, making sure that Paddington's hat was always red. So I always start out with yellow just to scare him a little bit. <laughs> and um, and the red will come up like this. And as I always tell the kids watching, when you have um, when you have one color to do like a blue color, that's very nice, but it's good to add a little bit of nuance to it, a little bit of shade here and there to make things look a little round because he is rather a round bear sometimes. And the duffel coat here, it's always difficult with the duffel coat for me. I'm not, I'm not sure I have the, the tabs on the, on the right way each time. And I think if you look at the pictures, they change from uh, drawing to drawing. Let's see the suitcase down like that. And he'll have to have a tag around his neck, of course, like so. And then the most important part, because he looks just a little dull right now, but there's always one little tweak that you can, you can add that'll bring a character to life. And that's just a little smile like that. And suddenly it becomes an animated, an animated bear. But that's, that's the bare bones of it. If you could imagine me actually using a, a very narrow propyl pen and uh, a whole bunch of uh, watercolors, then this is, oh, and also in actuality, the drawings are about this big, maybe about the size of his head like that because, oh my God, I can't keep track of anything this large. And a picture book, and, and it is a picture book. Come on. Yes. Anyway, that's that's our drawing demonstration for today. <laughs> Brilliant! That's absolutely fantastic, and it is amazing. You just putting on that smile is just so extraordinary. Isn't that ridiculous? Yeah. I mean, I I I I, I marvel at that. I I don't I don't understand that, and I intentionally leave that to the very end. So I have uh, I'm working on a book now. New Paddington book now, and it um, it's the drawings are a lot of bears with no mouths yet. Mm. So we've got to got to get you know get to the get to the happy place of of um, Paddington being being animated in the proper way. And what about the other characters? And I mean, Paddington has remained universal. But mm. here we are. You started doing this in the nineteen nineties. We we're many many years past that. Um, and what do we well, feel? Thanks a lot. <laughs> Not you are, we are. <laughs> uh, well, I'm sorry, that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you have to be included. <laughs> it, 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 some time has passed. People dress differently. Backgrounds have changed. Urban scenes have altered. Mm -hmm. um, Karen was talking about how uh, her father didn't exactly modernise the stories, but he did kind of also at the same time keep them up to date, like Paddington traveling with an Oyster card. How, how do you feel about, you know, the images that you showed Michael Bond when he first commissioned you? Uh, you must be adapting them all the time. Oh, absolutely. The, yeah. um, the images that I, I mean, I, I caught on very quickly that Michael wanted to make sure that Paddington was always living in the modern world. Right. He might not age and the Brown family might not age, but everything around them would be with each book completely up to date. In fact, I, I, managed, I, I wound up illustrating two versions of um, the picture book version of Paddington being found in Paddington Station because I did one at the, in the 90s at the beginning of um, working with Michael. And then about 10 or 15 years later, they had the affrontery to architecturally revamp Paddington Station. <laughs> and Michael became very annoyed um, that it's, it doesn't look the same. So I, I had to redo the whole book to make sure that, that uh, the architecture was the same. And now it's been redone again. I can only imagine what his thoughts are. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the characters, their dress, um, the things they use, I've introduced cell phones into the pictures now. Um, it's, it's exactly as, as Karen described it. It's, mm -hmm. uh, he, the, we did a picture book um, about the Olympics when the for um, for the Olympics coming to London, and uh, it was it's it's that type of 
of willingness to keep the character present in the world that I think makes Paddington so relevant, makes it possible to do relevant movies, makes it uh, like no one is going backwards in time. Mm. You know, it's not like Paddington lives in a food world where it's um, everything is, is just set the way it was in the books and that's that. Or, um, or you know, you, you had mentioned Peter Rabbit, they're, you know, working hard to try to try to figure out what to do with those characters. Sure. And yeah. it's, it's just a mishmash. Hmm. But um, uh, Paddington lives in the real world, so it's hmm. easy to illustrate him. Hmm. And when I couldn't get to, to, to London to, um, to get some reference for the illustrations, Michael would send me about 500 photographs of exactly what he wanted. And, and he was upset with me when I, I drew the wrong bus. <laughs> because what the roadmasters had, had had changed over to something brand new looking then you couldn't hop on and hop off the back anymore no we had bendy thinking. buses that would have been quite a new thing to put in yeah yes <laughs> and he was annoyed that i had the effrontery to do the old stuff <laughs> ridiculous so i did the new stuff but isn't that so interesting? I'm trying quickly while we're talking and I can't off the top of my head, but maybe somebody in the audience will think of a character who, like Paddington, um, has uh, remain, he remains universal, but the scenery behind him sort of alters and, in, and so makes, brings the stories up to date without really him changing. That is very clever. Because there are lots of queer, I mean, you know, in, in Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling makes Harry Potter grow up through the seven years of Hogwarts. In other stories like, well, you know, I don't know, Arthur Ransom or something, they don't grow up very much. Um, you know, there's, the, 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 it's an interesting thing about what you do with characters in fiction and how you, you grow them up. And I think this is an incredibly, it's almost like a, it, it feels like some sort of, I don't know, cartoon magic that you can have Paddington being Paddington, the universal figure everywhere, anywhere. And presumably, if people are reading, when people are reading, not if they are, when people are reading these stories around the world, uh, OK, you're now the illustrator of Paddington, not only in the US, but in other territories. How are you doing backgrounds for Paddington when he's in London, but it's written in Japanese? That luckily doesn't become an issue because the thing about Paddington is that he is a London bear. Right. And that, and that people um, need to have him be in London. Uh, occasionally in some, of the, in some of the stories, he will take a vacation with the Browns to France, mm -hmm. but um, that's very rare. Uh, most of the time he's right in London and there's no, the pictures that are, that um, that go in, in for other that are published in other countries are exactly the same, except for the languages that yeah. require the books to go back and forth. But then the pictures get <laughs> flopped, and they look all wonky to me. Um, but that's just like mirror handwriting. It's very confusing. Yeah. And, and the smile—I don't know—the smile doesn't turn out quite the way I like it. But nitpicking yeah i think that's nitpicking well that's a fantastic introduction i think makes us think a lot about the you know it keeps us back to this core paddington character and what is so important about him and as you say in your first you know when you first met michael bond and you first read the stories and you just knew there was something very very special and particular about the character so thank you very much for introducing us the visual side and now I'm going to move on to Hugh to talk about, because you came to Paddington as a child as well. He wasn't a sibling for you, obviously, but you read him when you were very young or Absolutely. somebody read him aloud to you? Well, I, no, I think that the, the reason I, I felt sad, like probably hundreds of thousands of other children of my generation, um, or indeed you know, ever since, um, he was the first book that I could really read for myself. And, uh, and so therefore my relationship with Paddington was very strong and vivid and, um, uh, and, and, and you form a, a, you know, a very a, a, a sort of protective ring about, around those characters that you grew up with. Which is why when I think the, the, you know, there was sort of the film was mooted, the first film was mooted, there was a sort of outcry of how dare you know, Hollywood, as it were, yeah, yeah. Um, attack our bear. And, um, but also you know, the, the, these characters, are so, they are so personal and, and, and so it is a big risk when you, when you try and translate them to another medium, be it TV, film or, or whatever, mm. or stage. Um, and so it was a, it was a, there was a, I was, you know, I was conscious that the, the team behind it were, um, were uh, had a great responsibility, put it that way. 
Yes, and I know from talking to them when they were sort of wanting to do it, they all passionately cared about Paddington too, and I'm sure Karen would agree that you couldn't, they wouldn't have ever been allowed the chance to make the film if they, like you and probably the rest of the cast, hadn't had quite a commitment to, the, to Paddington anyway. Well, I think, I, I, I'd like to think so, and I, I'm, you know, Karen is the one to ask because she was the, you know, the gatekeeper, so to speak, <laughs> but uh, I know that uh, David Heyman... Um, and Rosie Allison, uh, who, who nurtured the project, with, along with Paul King, who, who co-wrote and directed um, the, the, the first and second movies. Um, you know, I mean, basically, Paul King is Paddington. I mean, he, he is this sort of warm, round bear um, who uh, never does anything intentionally unkind. <laughs> and um, uh, and, and they're, they're, they, they really did care passionately about getting it right and, mm -hmm. and bringing uh, Karen and obviously particularly Michael along uh, w on the journey. And I, I don't know whether Karen can confirm or deny this, but when Michael did see the first cut of the film, or the final cut of the film, uh, he'd, after the screening, everyone was you know, pacing up and down outside mm. nervously, and he did have the good grace to say, I came, I saw, I was conquered. Very good. <laughs> I like that very much. Is that true, Karen? Is that it, true? That he... It's absolutely true, yeah. yes. In fact, my father and I didn't watch the very first screening of it together because we were both so nervous about what the other one would think. Um, <laughs> so we watched it separately. But yeah, he was completely blown away when he saw it. So how did you, I mean, they approached you, you, you heard yes. they were doing it. I, I have to tell you this because you can't all see, but... Uh, Hugh has got the most fantastic Paddington brooch on his jacket. Oh yes, um, which you can't kind zoom of in that close, I'm afraid. But, but it is. But it is. It is absolutely lovely, and it's difficult to be sitting looking at him and, and not notice it. And of course, then everything he says about Paddington is so clearly true because there he is with his kind of <laughs> badge on him. Yes, well, yes, I, I wear my Paddington badge with pride. Um, uh, no, I, I just got a call out of the blue, really, um, from David Heyman's office, and oh. I and I. I Paul King and I sat in David Heyman's waiting room um, like two nervous schoolboys about mm. to see the headmaster and mm. we went in and chatted and, uh, and that was the beginning of the, of the conversation, so to speak. Um, you know, dates didn't fit and all the rest of it, but eventually um, we, we got the machine rolling um, and it was a, obviously, as you appreciate, a vast machine. Just look at the, the credits at the end. You know, you get the, the usual block and then after about a minute it goes into five, five columns <laughs> and that goes on for another eight minutes while, um, because of all the... Well, the special effects were very special. They were remarkable <laughs> and... You know, up to you know, when you're working on a project like this with uh, all the sort of uh, digital wizardry that you mm. can't yourself imagine yet mm. uh, or see, and I thought, well, you know, it's gonna, they're going to have a good stab at it and it'll be all right. And then Rosie, I think, showed me a clip of, um, or Paul showed me a, cl a clip of the the first bit I saw was when he dunks his head down the loo, mm -hmm. and uh, I was absolutely blown away by the quality of the of the uh, of the digital. Yeah. effects and I thought wow we're, we're in for something quite special here and it grew and grew and I think by, by the time the the second film came along the, I think the artistry involved in in the characterization of Paddington in particular um, was was really was, was just incredible mm. well I think most of us as viewers had very much the same misgivings that you know you had thought initially um, because we're always frightened of, of something we love being sort of changed into something we don't love so much um, but for you playing Mr. Brown, I mean, I think Mr. Brown's a very interesting character because Paddington is clearly, you know, the hero in a sense. And Mr. Brown is, he's not an anti-hero, he is also a hero, but he's got to have a very different kind of part. What were you thinking about it when you took on the role? Well, it was very, and there's again, you know, tremendous credit to, to Paul um, and the co-writers on, on both films, really, because, you know, Paddington is, each, each of the stories within the, the novels uh, do each have a beginning, middle and end, each chapter does. They are sort of mm. perfect bedtime stories, mm. really. Um, and it's, uh, everyone resets to their default position, pretty much, mm -hmm. or Paddington does. You know, mm -hmm. he, he, he sets off to do something positive, it all goes horribly wrong, there's potential catastrophe, and then it ends up OK. Yeah. And usually with a, with a you know, cherry on top. Yeah. And, um, uh, and so, but the characters don't really develop. And of course, in, in, in film narrative, you, you often want some sort of development. Mm. And so the idea that Mr. Brown was incredibly tense and, 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 and wound up in, in, in our choice uh, at the world of insurance and risk analysis, 
um, and that the presence of the bear was the, you know, was the worst thing that could happen. And then by the end, this again is just in simple things like in the costume. At the beginning of the, of the show, of, of, of Mr. Brown's journey, he's wearing grey, he's very mm. conservative. By the end, he's wearing a red T-shirt and he's on mm. top of, the, mm. <laughs> on top of the, um, the museum, you know, defending this bear. So the idea that uh, the presence of, of, of the bear into the, is, is, is the catalyst in the life of the Browns that... that mm brings something, brings them together in a way that they hadn't anticipated. Mm. And Paul had talked about this in rehearsals, that uh, the Browns have a fissure in their relationship. So we rehearsed and improvised, Sally and I, sort of throwing crockery at each other. He said, no, that's not what I meant. There's just some, there's a sort of missing thing in, in, in the relationship. And uh, the presence of the bear begins to bring them together on this common journey. Mm. Um, and uh, that was obviously, you know, re re rebooted in the second film mm. um, with Mr. Brown's midlife crisis. Well, yes, it gets a bit kind of more carried away in the, se <laughs> yeah. in the second film. Perhaps more fun for you. It was, yes. yes. I mean, that must have been quite a ride. It, it, it was, way. actually, it was. And, uh, and, and again, the, the care that they all took, you know, there's a, the, the second film was, with both films, we reshot bits um, after they'd assembled the whole film. And in the second film, actually, Mr. Brown punched Phoenix Buchanan on the nose to sort of finish the, that a, a bit of the story. And I think the feeling was that that's not very Paddington-like to actually no. biff someone on the nose. Mm. So they re-unpicked the entire thread of the story and set it up that Mr. Brown used to be really brilliant at coconut shies. So that in the end, it's a, it's a coconut ball, a coconut shy ball that, that pings uh, Phoenix Buchanan at the end and not a fist, yeah. which is much more... Much more Paddington-like like, Paddington because it would be a yeah. mistake. Yeah, so which, we reshot that whole, that whole each of those scenes, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm very interested in what you said about the fissure between Mr. and Mrs. Brown because there's a one in the in the wonderful exhibition. There's a very short clip uh, just from the moment that they find Paddington on the station, and I think you said that. I mean, what you have just described is so evident in that very brief moment between you and Mrs. Brown. You know, when she has one response and Mr. Brown has one completely different response. And it's how the rest of the story is going to kind of bring them together. I mean, that's a wonderful way of looking at it. That's a whole new take on that. It, 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 it is, and I hope it isn't uh, against the spirit of, of you know, of, 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 of what Michael intended, because you don't get a sense in the stories that there's a, div a division or difference of opinion, and they may have, you know, uh, slightly, slightly different attitudes to, to the adventures they go on. But, uh, in, in again, in the film narrative, you've already, you know, in the opening scene, Sally's character is already in red. She's already a woman who enjoys uh, the adventures in life. Yeah. You know? And she's this, in, in, in Paul's version, you know, she's the illustrator and she's looking for her hero character mm. and what he, what he looks like. Mm. Um, and uh, so, again, yeah, so it's just a, it's, it's really clever writing, I think, mm. actually, the way that Paul, Paul developed that, that these tiny little moments of, uh, of difference um, uh, and, uh, and, and rift gradually, um, are, and, and, and of course the, the genuine explosion of Paddington into their life, ruining their bathroom and everything yes, else, quite. Um, actually becomes the catalyst for change and, and uh, bringing the entire family together. Yeah, but they couldn't, I mean, the, I agree that the film is very well written, but all of that comes out of what Michael Bond originally, you know, the richness that they could take and turn into a completely different kind of story in some respects, but with the bones of the original comes, I think, from Michael Bond's creativity. Oh, uh, that, absolutely, one hundred percent. It's all there um, for people to, you know, develop really. Absolutely, and I think yes, as you said earlier, you know, you, you tinker with the integrity of that bear at your peril, mm. and um, uh, and to and to find a, 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 a sweetness, but a sense of adventure, and. Mm. Um, and, and the fact that we all, you know, we've all been that, that bear somewhere. Mm. We've all needed that helping hand at a new school or mm. at a, in, a, in a new country or moving mm. to a new town. Um, and of course, the, you know, the, the, all the themes that were particularly highlighted in, in both the films to do with um, uh, being an outsider, yeah. immigration, um, all those themes that were, you know, the, the evacuees or the refugees, mm. um, uh, all those themes swirl around in, in, in Michael's character and, and are illustrated in, in, in both films. And I think, you know, in, in a... In, in a, such a touching way, I think. Mm. Well, it must have been amazing making the films when you did and realising that, you know, books written in 1958 had that absolute modernity. Well, that's and right. Rather no. depressing, you could say. Well, the, the, yes, the theme was still there, but it was very live when the films came out. Uh, absolutely, yes. I mean, you know, we, history just keeps on repeating itself. Mm. But the the, the, the the kinder transport image in the in, in the first film is, mm. is, is, I think, is a beautiful little mm. uh, touch. Mm. Um, and of course, the you know, the image of uh, as, as Karen's alluded to, and, and as we all know famously, the you know the the, 
the um, you know the, the tag around the neck, mm. you know, being either mm. the, the the child with the gas mask on, yeah, on Paddington, you know, yeah. all that, yeah. um, uh, as well as as the themes of, of you know the, the, the tensions within Notting Hill, as Karen said, when mm. when she was growing up. Um, mm. So uh, they're there, they're very present without you know hopefully bashing anyone over the head, and, and Paddington is the absolute symbol of mm. of uh, needing acceptance and and offering help. Mm. And the film's gone around the world, hasn't it? I know, yes. And so what do people, how do, how do people who weren't perhaps brought up on Paddington view them? Do they, do you think they see them more as a romp than we do maybe? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think, uh, I, I think perhaps the, 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 the Paddington as a, as a, as a character, as a, as, a, as a sequence of books, perhaps hasn't you know, grown up as, as well in, say, France, for example, mm. uh, hasn't, hasn't been as popular there initially um, as in English speaking countries but um, but the film seems to have resonated because of mm. because it's because the character of Paddington is so universal yeah. and that's why he survived down the decades and will continue to mm. do so mm. and into different medium I mean exactly that's, yeah that's definitely going to go on happening um, well thank you very much and I mean I always love hearing about how you, cho you choose a part to take I once heard Simon Russell Beale saying he was very bad at choosing a part picking a part he often chose bad parts for himself so I thought about you and taking on this part and I thought how did you decide this was a part you knew you must do oh gosh I think um well I think when I read the script I mean when on page one you see uh, and they were describing going through the the uh the the jungle uh, and carrying a small timepiece and there's a grandfather clock I thought <laughs> I'm I'm on I'm board I'm, I'm on board this is funny this is Paddington <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, uh, that's a wonderful uh, bit of background to the film, which I think has um, just given us all so much pleasure. Um, and as I say, very, very unusual to have a film that makes us all as happy as, and that made Michael and you happy as well, Karen. I mean, that is a real accolade. <laughs> um, Alison, now let's get down to the nuts and bolts of the really fabulous exhibition here at the British Library. Um, it's very original, it's very child friendly, and I urge you to come and see it, but Alison will give us a little account of it. Thank you, Alison. So I was lucky enough to be appointed lead curator of Paddington, the story of a bear towards the end of February 2020. And uh, you all know what happened soon after that. So it's been a very interesting experience to curate an exhibition in these circumstances and uh, with limited and intermittent access to the St Pancras building for more than a year, it was even difficult to consult our own material. We had to select and view loans remotely. I spent a few very concentrated days standing in our exhibitions department looking through as many Paddington stories as possible and making notes. But obviously, overall, it was a very cheering and joyous subject to be focusing on during these dark times and discovering more about the adventures, family and friends of a bear famed for his kindness and politeness. So I'd like to thank all those who've contributed to and supported the exhibition, including the copyrights group and those who've loaned material our travel partner GWR and the Unwin Charitable Trust. But for my own sake, I'd like to also add my personal thanks to the exhibitions team and the learning team without whose help, especially in those circumstances, it wouldn't have been possible. So some of you might know we work with two local schools in Camden to co-design aspects of the exhibition. And we're very grateful to the students and staff involved. The year four students from Argyle Primary School created a playful marmalade trail which runs throughout the exhibition and they invited Fred families to make movements, actions and freeze frames in response to exhibits. And year three students from Edith Neville Primary School explored themes of home and belonging, responded to the question, if you were going on an adventure like Paddington, what one thing would you pack in your suitcase to remind you of home? And their colourful images of the chosen objects are displayed in a digital suitcase uh, in the adventures section. And colleagues from learning work with both classes remotely from November 2020 to March 2021, and they were the first schools to visit the exhibition. So this, their work helped with our discussions about the level of interactivity that people would feel comfortable with in current circumstances. So we don't have our usual reading area, but we do have those marmalade splats, opportunities for visitors to practice their hard stares and take their own self-portrait, and a few and a, and a free printed exhibition trail for visitors to pick up on, on their arrival at the exhibition and keep as a souvenir. And you can also enjoy the breakfast table, which sets and clears itself. I think you might have just glimpsed it in the image you were seen, seen just now. So to the exhibition, it's arranged in three main sections, beginnings, 
home and adventures. And I'd like to introduce you to just a few of the over 50 items we're displaying here, which include illustrated books from our own collections, original artwork, memorabilia on loan from Michael Bond's family, plush toys and sound and film clips. So in beginnings, we focus on two main strands, the creation of the first Paddington stories by Michael Bond and the story of Paddington's journey to England from Peru. And to tell the story of the creation of Paddington, we're lucky enough to have Michael's notebook from 1957, loaned by the estate of Michael Bond, in which he wrote notes and ideas for his early Paddington stories. So you've heard from Karen that the inspiration for the Paddington stories came from a toy bear, which Michael had found in Selfridges in London, all alone on the shelf on Christmas Eve 1956, and he bought it as an extra Christmas present for his wife, and they called it Paddington after the station. And the result was the publication of A Bear Called Paddington by Collins in October 1958. And we have a copy of the first edition, which was loaned by Karen, signed by Michael and given to his parents with Peggy Fortnum's distinctive pen and ink drawings of Paddington on the dust jacket. In the second section called Home, that's one of the images you can see at the moment, we focus on friends and family, Aunt Lucy in Peru, the Browns in London, and Paddington's friends and neighbours nearby. And you can find a model of the door to number 32 Windsor Gardens, where the Browns live. Paddington's adventures were made into a television series by Filmfare in 1975, and Ivor Wood, the series creator, gave this door to Michael Bond as a present uh, to mark the 25th anniversary of the publication of A Bear Called Paddington. And again, this was loaned by the estate of Michael Bond. But after the Brown family, Paddington's closest friend in London is Mr. Gruber. Uh, you probably heard Bob talking about illustrating him. And he takes Paddington on trips to explore London and give him helpful advice, gives him lots of helpful advice. <coughs> and you can see Fred Banbury's illustration of him sharing elevenses or cocoa and buns in a book from our collections. And then the wider community, including the market traders from Portobello Road, can be found in David McKee's original artwork, loaned by the artist, of Paddington's Magical Christmas. You might have glimpsed that as you were looking at the slides. They've been in a Christmas Day procession based on the carol, The Twelve Days of Christmas. So in that section as well, we're lucky enough to have a wooden trunk made by Michael Bond to hold the clothes made for the original bear by his wife, again, loaned by Karen. And a Peggy Fortnum illustration in oil pastel, loaned by Harper Collins Publishers, which shows Paddington sitting behind his birthday cake, and you definitely saw that. The final section, Adventures, contains a number of books from our own collections, including pop-ups and translations, as well as original artwork by David McKee and Peggy Fortnum. And we also have artwork by R.W. Alley, brackets Bob, loaned by Karen of Paddington on the operating table in hospital after, spoiler alert, a slight accident with a boomerang. <laughs> and this story, Paddington Goes to Hospital, was written by Michael with Karen as a way of reassuring children about what might happen in hospital. So Paddington at St Paul's is one of the many picture books illustrated by Bob that we include it was the last picture book about Paddington written by Michael Bond, and it was published in 2018, 60 years after the publication of A Bear Called Paddington. So that's just a tiny taster to whet your appetite. I hope it's given you an idea of the range of the items in the exhibition, and I hope you'll go and see the exhibition if you haven't already. As uh, Julia said at the beginning, it runs until the 31st of October, and I hope you'll leave wanting to read or reread the many stories about this wonderful bear. It's been a great privilege to be involved in this. Thank you very much. And that gave us a very good impression of, of how it is when you go into the gallery. And this, the, the real thing about it is the amazing amount of interactive stuff there is for children to do, um, as well as the incredible number of editions, which is quite, really quite staggering. Um, we've now got some questions um, and I've got them here on the iPad, so I will read them. And the first one is addressed to you, Karen, um, which is, uh, how does it feel sharing Paddington with the world? It must be strange having somewhat things so central to your family being adored across the globe. Do you ever wish you could keep him to yourself? <laughs> you know, Paddington is so special. I, I would feel wrong keeping him to myself. Um, it's a lovely question. And, and, I, and I guess perhaps possibly when, when, I don't know, I was going to say when my father died, it was quite hard because um that was a very sort of personal moment but at the same time it was 
rather lovely that so many people around the world cared so much. So, so now I'm very happy to share, share Paddington with the world. And there was, um, uh, yes, I mean, it, the, what's extraordinary is the uh, statue of Paddington at Paddington Station being such a magnet for cards of remembrance of all sorts, you know, and birthday cards and everything. And that sense that everybody feels they have, that he belongs to them. So it was very generous of you to <laughs> let him come out and, and us, us all to have a part in him. And uh, you know, something that's very special is that people still leave little items on his headstone, uh, which is... A, in Paddington Old Cemetery, mm. and uh, and they leave little Paddingtons and, and and little things for him. So that's also very special. Mm. Um, and Hugh, this is a question for you, properly addressed as Mr. Bonneville, not like me, just saying Hugh. <laughs> How do you feel about the differences between the book version and the film version of your character? The film version, Mr. Brown, is written as a little more cynical and distrustful than he appears in the book. Also, anything you can tell us about Paddington 3? The country is in desperate need. <laughs> <laughs> well, the answer to the first one really is, <laughs> as I alluded to earlier, I think, you know, the, the, the character of, of, of Paddington is, um, is the core of, of the books. And, um, and Mr Brown is, um, uh, I'm not going to say stereotypical because that's, that's, the, that's not quite right, but, but he's, a, he, he's a, ge a generic character, perhaps. Mm. I, think that's, I hope that's not too rude a thing to say. Um, but he is a, he's an establishment figure, you know, in terms of the, of the, of the family set up and uh, a, li a little bit hard to read sometimes. And I think Paul King just really wanted to grab it and, and polish it up and put him into a, an extreme, you know, extreme position so that he's got a, a good journey to go on. And, uh, we'd, and once, you know, I'd, I'd contributed my halfpenny worth, uh, we found a way of, of developing Mr. Brown as, uh, yes, as perhaps this uh, very, very ca overly cautious man who then finally breaks free. Isn't he a very 1950s father, I sort of feel? Oh, I um, suppose, I suppose, yes. I mean, bearing yeah. in mind he was, uh, you know, ri written in, in, in the 50s. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and uh, the, as for Paddington 3, uh, I keep hearing that there is one, so that's great. Um, <laughs> no, I think that there's, I haven't seen a script, um, but there, there are very confident signs that we'll shoot in sometime next year. Where do they get shot? Uh, they, all around London, really. Right. Um, um, yes, because a lot was in Primrose Hill. Yes, it? some yeah. of it was Primrose Hill and um, the studios north, west and south. Yeah. Um, another question for you, Karen. Did your father have a hard stare? Sorry, yeah, I was just trying to unmute. Um, he, he did. Um, yes, on occasion, he did. There, there was another side to him. So, uh, <laughs> so I think that possibly did come from him, actually. Didn't use it too often, but uh, if he did, you knew that uh, it, was, it was time to behave yourself. It was time to stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and then we've got another question, which is, um, it's not speci specific who it's to, which is, could Paddington be an ambassador and wouldn't that make the world a better place? Now, it seems to me that uh, people must have, in, in the years, Karen, that uh, you've been working with Paddington, there must have been approaches to Paddington to front various campaigns and um, causes uh, do you, is that something you've ever taken on board for him? Oh, absolutely. In fact, um, my, my father, when Paddington first came onto television, that's when he became very popular. And my father was getting a lot of approaches from charities. So it was decided, he decided that he would support one particular charity, which he's still the figurehead of um, all those years later. So 1976 to now, so I can't do the maths, but that's something like 45 years. He's been the figurehead of action medical research for, for children. So that's one of the things he does. He's also involved for... I believe now with with UNICEF on a, on a, on an international basis. Um, so yes, I think he'd make an absolutely excellent ambassador. And you never know, he might get get an offer from from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, if he's if he's if he's campaigning for UNICEF, he's already on the road, isn't he? I mean, that's exactly where he he should be. Um, and then we've got uh, one more question. Um, one more question, which is really for you, uh, Rob, which is about. Um, the other characters, it's not about Paddington, it's about the children. Did you like developing the children? Did you like working on them as well as working on Paddington? There, I am unmuted. <laughs> you don't want to have a random sneeze going on around. <laughs> um, yes, I did like developing the other characters. The thing about... Um, the thing about Paddington is that he is such a um, 
visually arresting character that you're, you can be tempted as an illustrator to focus your entire illustration on him. Mm -hmm. And it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be right um, because he has, the whole point of his characters is to live in the world with other characters. And the other characters have to have equal weight. They have to have equal lives and mm -hmm. you have to somehow or other show that through your illustration. It's, uh, it's one of the things that makes the film version so nice um, because Paddington, the, the, the artistry in creating the CGI Paddington allows that character to just flow seamlessly in with, uh, in with the human characters. And, I, and with illustration, I tried to do the same thing, although obviously I don't have the facility to be, um, be uh, quite as realistic. So I rely on drawing everybody very loosely and sloppily and as long as they're loose and sloppy together in the same way, it seems to work. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, and then this is our, our final question. Um, um, Alison, uh, this is a question about the exhibition. Um, it's, what do you think is the most exciting item in the exhibition, which guests are unlikely to have ever seen before? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, I suppose there are two things that have been loaned by... Um, the Michael Bond estate, which is the notebook and the little trunk of the clothes that yeah. were made for the original bear. And they're kind of two standout items that are in the, the current exhibition. Yeah, I would agree with that. The little trunk, which your mother made, is that right, Karen? Your mother made the trunk and the clothes? Uh, no, actually my father made it. He was very, oh. very handy. Um, ah. And uh, he, he made it complete with all the, the, the brass fittings and everything. And uh, uh, my, I think my mother made some of the clothes yeah. that, that were inside it, yeah. yeah. That is, a, that is a wonderful treasure, I agree. I think that's something that people would be, you know, that nobody would have ever seen that before. So that is just a wonderful item in, in, in amongst all the other things in, in the collection. Um, and that brings us to the close of, of this lovely event. Thank you all so much. Karen, Bob, Hugh, Alison, for your contributions to this very wide ranging conversation. And Really, thank you, Michael Bond, for giving us Paddington. Thank you all, and good night.